uh, that we can host and have Bill speak into uh, the life of the church here and and every single life here. And I ask that you would just uh, honour the man of God, Bill. You're in our. You're in my car. You're in my phone. You're in my head. <laughs> You're in my heart almost as much as Jesus is, but um, it is just really, 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 really great. So I'm going to ask you, let's stand and let's just honour Pastor Bill Johnson here to Manningham Christian Centre. Thank you. Nice to see you. Glad you showed up. Are you happy? Yeah? You good? Are you good? Yeah. Is your, is your neighbor doing all right? Look, look at him and be honest. How many of you think they need some help? It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's fun to be back in Australia. It's great to be in Melbourne, I've been uh, doing a conference over at Stairway for 10 years, and uh, which is a long conference, 10 years. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, coming back every year, and uh, I've had a wonderful time. It's a real treat to be here with you guys, and and uh, thankful, thankful so much for the opportunity. Um, I have things that I like to read. <laughs> Several days ago, as I left a meeting at a hotel, I gave myself a TSA pat-down looking for my keys. They weren't in my pockets. A quick search in the meeting room revealed nothing. Suddenly, I realized I must have left them in the car. Frantically, I headed for the parking lot. My husband has scolded me many times for leaving the keys in the ignition. My theory is the ignition is the best place not to lose them. His theory is that the car will be stolen. As I burst through the door, I came to the terrifying conclusion his theory was right. The parking lot was empty. Immediately, I called the police. I gave them my location, confessed I had left my keys in the car, and it had been stolen. Then I made the most difficult call of all. Honey, I stammered. I always call him honey in times like this. I left my keys in the car, and it's been stolen. There was a long silence. I thought the call had ended, had been dropped, but then I heard his voice. Are you kidding me? He barked. I dropped you off. (laughs) Now it was my turn to be silent. (laughs) Embarrassed, I said, well, then come and get me. He responded, I will, as soon as I convince this cop I didn't steal your car. (laughs) Uh, I think it's so funny. (laughs) A man had 50-yard line tickets for the Super Bowl. That's a little sporting event we have in our country. As he sat down, he noticed the seat next to him was empty. He asked the man on the other side of the empty seat whether anyone was sitting there. No, the man replied, the seat is empty. This is incredible, he said. Who in their right mind would have a seat like this for the Super Bowl, the biggest sporting event in the country, and not use it? The second man replied, well, actually, the seat belongs to, my, uh, to me. I was supposed to come with my wife, but she passed away. This will be the first Super Bowl we haven't been together uh, since we got married in 1967. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. That's terrible. But couldn't you find someone else, a friend, a relative, or even a neighbor to take the seat? The man shook his head. No, they're all at the funeral. the best laugher of everyone right there. (laughs) Just on cue, just turn it on. It's like a button. Oh, so funny. I want to talk to you about uh, Renewed Mind. 
A renewed mind isn't uh, the ability to give a biblical answer when a problem arises. A renewed mind is actually thinking and seeing from divine perspective. It's, I don't think it's possible to have a renewed mind without a divine encounter. Encounters with God change perspective. It's, it's not a matter of discipline, although discipline is important. Discipline kind of sets us up for things, but it's not the answer in and of itself. It takes us places, but it, it, the encounter with the Lord is the ongoing essential element in every one of our lives. The renewed mind is, um, I think, is the greatest, greatest way into a life of miracles. I, I, I talk about miracles a fair amount, uh, not because I need them, you know, I, I don't need the entertainment value of a miracle to feel good about myself or feel good about life. I, I just am responsible when he put the spirit of the resurrected Christ in us. It's supposed to affect things that are impossible. It's supposed to. I, I have that obligation. I have the obligation to bring him fruit of the impossible. And uh, so it's, it's, it's more uh, uh, an essence of responsibility for me than, than it is any entertainment value. I'm, I'm perfectly and completely enthralled with the person of Jesus Christ. I don't need miracles to, to feel good about life. But I, I'll tell you, when I look at the life of Jesus and the example that he set, I, I, just, I suddenly become uh, dissatisfied with what I can do with my talents and gifts. And it's not as though our talents and gifts are worthless. They're, you know, they're wonderful. God gave them to us. He gave us, each of us, different abilities and uh, unique uh, uh, perspectives on life that are very valuable. But, you know, uh, my gifts are kind of like... Uh, they're kind of like sails on a boat, all of our gifts. This would be like a harbor, and we sit here and look at each other's gifts, and we see the green and yellow sail over here and the red and white sail here and the blue sail. And, and we can you know, be you know, enthralled with one another's giftings and be impressed with one another's sail, but they only serve one purpose, and that's to catch wind. It's to, catch, it's to catch wind to drive that sailboat, and the gifts in our life are to catch the breath of God. That supernatural element in life is is supposed to be expressed through what God has given us to be and to do. I I live with the conviction that the renewed mind is is the best um, the the best the most consistent way for us to don't stand there. Um, the most consistent way to see miracles flow in and through our life. Uh, there's a lot of way that miracles happen. You'll uh, faith, just that gift of faith is extraordinary. I remember a gal came to me once. She uh, she had a uh, uh, an electric pump on her on her hip and with medication, and she could live only four minutes without that medication. And it was wired directly into her heart. And that medication, she'd have to change it every morning at seven o'clock. And, uh, and she came to me uh, one evening for prayer. And when she walked up, this is the only time this has happened in my life. So this isn't, I, I wish it was normal, but, but, but this is the first and only time. When she walked up, I actually felt the presence of faith. I, I was so stunned by it. I, I literally, she, she, she walked up, she asked me to pray for her, and I, I was stunned by what I felt on her. I actually stood back like this, and I looked at her from head to toe, toe to head. I, what I was doing is I was, I was wanting every cell in my being to recognize what I was witnessing because I had never seen it before like this. Wow. Most of the time what we call faith is actually hope. Faith is a knowing. Yes. Faith is an absolute. And, uh, and what, what I was witnessing was so extraordinary. So she told me her story, asked for prayer, and I prayed for her. She went down into the power. It's not necessary for that to happen, for people to get healed. In fact, probably 90% of the time they don't. But in this particular case, she went down. When she got up, I said, how are you doing? She said, there's a burning. I feel heat or a fire in my lungs and heart. It was a heart-lung issue. 
And as she walked away, I said, your faith got you this one. Because I, I realized this. All I did was partner with her faith. And, and uh, she went down. She got up. She came back the next night, 24 hours later, uh, to, to the meeting that we had. And she said, when I got up this morning, the Lord spoke to me and said, I didn't need them to change the medication. I mean, you got four minutes to find out if you heard from God or not. <laughs> you suddenly appear before the Lord and go, oops. <laughs> Apparently I'm here a little early. Sorry about that. <laughs> she, she came back that night. She unplugged the medication and was, uh, and was healed because of faith. So I believe faith is, is such a huge part of the life of miracles. And, and it, it, it always is. Um, the anointing, that sense of presence. Um, we've seen people heal from from touching clothing, from, you know, like when they touch the edge of Jesus' garment. The same Holy Spirit that was on him is on you and me. And there are times where he manifests so overtly, so outwardly, that people can literally be healed by touching clothing. It's extraordinary. We've seen that happen. I've seen people healed by the shadow, just literally walking by them, and a deliverance, a healing takes place. That anointing, that presence, the, the most fun, I mean, I love that stuff, but the most fun is is when I see people, uh, they'll come to me after the meeting at, at home. I always go to the back door and, and shake people's hands and stuff uh, after each service. And uh, or actually, after two of my three morning services, the third one, I hurry home. But anyway, it's another, another story. It's, uh, shut up, Bill. <laughs> Too much information. I, I get there at 5.30, and I, I, the last service, I get through about 3 o'clock. And so it's a long day, so I get home for a little rest because we have another one that night. So, but anyway, I, I go to the back door and I like to shake hands with people and give them hugs and just, you know, take a moment. It's like my 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 brief contact with humanity, you know. And I, there's not a whole lot of fellowship from the pulpit towards the audience, you know. So it gives me a moment to connect with folks. And and um, I, I remember standing back there one uh, one particular Sunday, and over a period of maybe 15 or 20 minutes, two people came by, and both of them uh, told me they had been healed of the effects of a broken neck. Both of them broken, bo- broken necks, and they were both sitting in the same section uh, of the church, and they were healed during worship. Anointing, that presence. We've seen, we've seen people not need their glasses anymore. An individual couldn't read his Bible. He was angry and frustrated why he couldn't read. When he got home, he just was, took his glasses off and sat there frustrated. What's happening to my eyes? And then he realized, oh, I must have gotten healed because I can see fine. <laughs> so that's kind of funny. He didn't think of it earlier. But, uh, uh, but you know, uh, cancer. We've seen cancer disappear. So uh, what I'm saying is the anointing, that sense of presence brings extraordinary miracles. And, and I, I'm, I'm not trying to give formulas or shortcuts. I'm just saying these are the effects. The effects effects of faith, the effects of the anointing. I, but I feel like the renewed mind is the most consistent way for us to live a lifestyle of miracles. Is that of interest to anybody? Because if it isn't, change your interest because I'm going to talk about it. <laughs> it. You know, it is our interest. It's our interest uh, because that's what you get when you're born again. It's just a part of your DNA. It's part of your natural desire. And you actually have to get disappointed out of it or bad teaching to get out of it because it's the most natural desire in the world for a new believer, for any believers to hunger, for God to do impossible things through them. So the renewed mind, why do I say that? Because in Romans 12, it says, Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God, that which is good, acceptable, and perfect. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. The renewed mind transforms a person. A transformed person transforms a city. The goal of the Lord is always to bring a reformational impact on cities and nations. But it starts with the renewed mind. So he says, the renewed mind... Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove the will of God. What's the will of God? 
the clearest definition of the will of God is found in what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer. It's, it's technically not the Lord's Prayer, our Father who are in heaven, because in the prayers, confession is sin, and he never sinned. So he was giving us a pattern prayer, a concept prayer to work with. So in his prayer, he says, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. What's the next phrase? Your your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What's the will of God? On earth as it is in heaven. I believe it's the greatest revelation in the New Testament on the purpose of God for humanity on this planet. Everything else yields to that directive. Everything else yields to that command. Everything else serves that command, if you will. Our, our assignment, our privilege, our responsibility is always to, to bring the revelation of his world, the manifestation of his world, into this one. So what does that look like if there's poverty? It means it changes. It means the cycle of poverty is broken. The way of thinking that allows for poverty. An entitlement spirit actually gives poverty a home. Learning how to shift our perspectives on reality, thinking the way God thinks, the way he reasons. And don't think for a moment that that's impossible or impractical. It's extremely practical because he commanded it. Do you understand he doesn't? together. I, I don't know if you guys have this happen if you travel much, but I lay in the hotel room and I wake up and I lay there and I think, where am I? <laughs> what country am I in? What city? And where's the bathroom? Those are the questions. <laughs> <right there. laughs> There's this passage out of Luke that says, nothing is impossible with God. Say that with me. Nothing is impossible with God. Say it again. Nothing is impossible with God. It's amazing to me that here God himself lives in this realm that no other part of creation lives in. Everything else is finite. Everything else has limitation, restrictions, etc., But he alone lives in this realm called nothing is impossible. That's where he lives. And then he wanted you and me to join him there. So he said, nothing is impossible for those who believe. So now actual biblical faith gives us access to live in a realm where only God himself lives. That's where nothing is impossible. So that verse... You guys doing all right? How much time do I have? I'm doing good. All right. I don't want the floor to open up and swallow me, you know, because I went over. So I'm I'm, I'm I'm teasing. I'm teasing. So here's this verse. Nothing is impossible with God. The word nothing is actually two words uh, in the original language. It's the word no, and it's the word um, rhema, which is implies the spoken word of God, the, the breathed word. It's, it's like when you're reading the word of God, the scripture. How many of you have had this happen where you're reading the Bible and suddenly a verse leaps out at you? All right, so you're reading Logos and suddenly it comes alive. You just got hit with rhema. And so here when, when the Lord says nothing is impossible with God, nothing means no rhema. No freshly spoken word of God will be impossible. The word impossible means without ability. So here's one of the ways that verse can be translated. No freshly spoken word of God will ever come to you that does not contain its own ability to perform itself. Wow. I think that's, 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 that's huge. That, that makes me realize, oh my goodness. Every time God speaks, he's actually creating capacity. Does that make sense? It's, 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 he's not saying... Here's a job, go do it. He's saying, 
here, I'm going to enter you and make this possible. And so when he says something, he's actually giving us the capacity to perform the very thing he said, which, which means we need to take another look at the Great Commission because he said, go disciple nations. He said, perhaps you've never heard this. He said, <laughs> go disciple nations. He actually, in the command, released the capacity, the ability to do what is absolutely impossible. This, one of the main responsibilities we have before the Lord is to hear what he says with our heart. Not just the intellectual acknowledgement of a truth. Anyone can sit in a meeting and say amen to something they believe. But when it pierces the heart, it changes my capacity, changes how I live, changes how I function. And so when he speaks, uh, James chapter 1 says, In humility... Receive the word implanted, which is able to save your soul. Okay, in humility, that's the what? That's the condition of the heart's soil, the soil of the heart. In humility, receive the word implanted, so the seed gets planted, which is able. That word is able to save your soul. You say, well, I, I'm, I'm already saved. Yeah, that's, that, that may be true. I was saved, but I'm also being saved, and someday I'm going to be saved. And all three realities exist in Scripture. I, I, I was born again on such and such a date, but I am being saved. He's, he's helping me to work out that salvation. Someday he's going to return and I'm really going to be saved. And so all three layers are there. And so he says, in humility, receive the word implanted. Why? Because that word, that seed carries the DNA of God and it is able to save your soul. If you take a kernel of corn, you plant it in the ground, an ear of corn grows from it, but there's hundreds of kernels. Each of the kernels of corn have the same DNA of the seed that was planted. Jesus was the kernel that died, and your life sprang up from his death and that life carries his DNA. That's why we have to, we have to realize that resentment, um, offense, uh, disappointment, all these things work to distort DNA, work to distort who he's made you to be, who he's made me to be. So here he says, in humility, receive the word implanted. Why? Because the ability for my transformation is actually in the word. Okay, you guys alive? Everyone still alive? All right. Me too, I'm still alive. So we got, we got a real strange situation in the first part of the Gospels where we have in, uh, in Luke, we have an angel showing up to John the Baptist's dad before John is conceived. And he shows up to Zacharias, and he says, Elizabeth's going to have a child. And his response was, how do I know this is really going to happen? <laughs> I love how the angel talks to him. He says, oh, number one, <laughs> I'm Gabriel. <laughs> how'd you like to have an a angel answer you like this hey, you have a question how do I know this is going to happen number one I'm Gabriel number two I stand in the presence of God in other words that's a stupid question <laughs> now God's never opposed to questions but he is opposed to challenges a ch uh, challenges might be the wrong word he is opposed to us questioning him putting him on trial where he has to prove himself does that make sense that, that's not a smart thing to ever do. And so John the Baptist, dad, says, how do I know this is real? How, how do I know this is really going to happen? In other words, I, we've, been, we've had so much disappointment over the, this whole issue of having a child. We've never been able to have a child. How do I know this is the real time? Well, the angel of the Lord shows up to Mary a short while later. 
and says, uh, you're going to give birth to the Christ child. I, I mean, you know, that's, that's a stretch. That's, that's, that's a stretch, um, especially because she says, I'm, I'm a virgin. How can this be? And the Lord speaks to her. Uh, the, the angel speaks to her. I mean, you know, after the angel explained, the angel said, the spirit of the Lord's going to come upon you. I, I mean, you know, she still didn't understand <laughs> how that was going to happen. No, in other words, okay, I'm still as confused as I was when I asked the question. But she settled into the fact that God was able to make the impossible happen. And so she said, be it unto me. I think it's one of the best prayers in the Bible. Be it unto me according to your word. In other words, I don't understand it, but I don't need to understand it for it to happen. I just need to yield. So I surrender and I say, be it unto me. I'm giving the word a place in me for you to perform what only you can perform. This is, the, this is honestly the process of the renewed mind. It's our daily walk with the Lord. It's our, it's our daily walk with the Lord. Look at this passage in, Ju- in John 16. I love the Bible. I love, I love, I love the Bible. John is, uh, the Gospel of John is especially rich in, um, uh, Mark's Gospel is especially rich in revealing what the renewed mind looks like. And that's where I'm hoping to get to. I may not get there today. John's Gospel is rich in showing, showing the, um, kind of this this walk with God where you where it's almost like uh, forgive me for stammering here but it's almost like John lifts a curtain to see behind the scenes how the spirit of God works and th- to me that is extremely fascinating and, and we have a statement for example in John 6 um do you guys remember the sermon that Je- Jesus preached where he said, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood, and he, he grossed out an entire crowd of people, you know? I mean, I mean he's, he's, got, he's got the greatest revival going, you know? He's multiplied food. People are getting healed and delivered. The crowds are massive, and they're just loving life. And then Jesus stands up and preaches the most unpopular sermon ever. You know, it's the one sermon that nobody downloaded on the Internet that week. You know, it, was, it was like... Nobody wrote home and said, oh, Mom, you got to hear this one. Uh, that just didn't happen. And so the people are so freaked out over the message because he's standing up there saying, you actually have to eat me. And the people are going, you know, things were going so well before he started this sermon, you know. <laughs> and if you can imagine being on a hillside where Jesus has multiplied food, people are getting healed, it's just, there's just this life, this energy, this excitement in the air. And then he throws a wet blanket over the whole deal talking about drinking blood and eating flesh. And little by little, you know, you see the families get up and go, come on, Martha, we got to get out of here. And so they get up and they leave. And there's this mass, mass exodus where you get like 15,000 people on a hillside. And after, you know, 30 minutes of this particular sermon, uh, he's left with 12 disciples. <laughs> and that's church growth at its finest. That's, <laughs> that right there should encourage every pastor, you know. So he's got like 12 guys left, and he turns to them, and he says, uh, says, you guys leaving? And Peter says, where are we going to go? We, you have the words of eternal life. I, uh, Peter, you know, we, we, we mock him a lot, mostly because we identify so much with his mistakes, his blunders. But he, he, he nailed it. He said, where are we going to go? You have words of eternal life. What does that mean? Where are we going to go? Every time you speak, we come alive inside. We don't know what you just taught. We don't get it any more than the crowd that left. But we have no place to go. We've burned our bridges. Plus, we realize every time you open your mouth, something happens inside of us. And we we can't comprehend it. We can't repeat the sermon and have it make any sense. But when you talk, life is given to us. Does that that make sense to you? So here here Jesus is explaining this, this mystery to them. It's in John 6. It's about verse 63. He says, My words to you are spirit 
and they are life. You know, think about it. My words are spirit and they are life. Now, who's Jesus? According to the Gospel of John, though, uh, a great way to study subjects is through that particular book and through that particular writer's perspective. It, it adds such a quality because the, the language that a writer uses will be consistent. So here in the Gospel of John, he says, he says, my words to you are spirit and they are life. Well, what did John write about Jesus in chapter 1? He said, the word of God was made flesh. So now we have Jesus, the word of God made flesh, standing before humanity. And now he announces, not only is the word of God made flesh, but whenever I talk to you, I only say what I hear the Father say. And therefore, the word of God becomes spirit. All right? So first the word of God became flesh, and now every time he talks, the word of God becomes spirit. It, it should help us to understand why things happened whenever he spoke, why people would, would get dialed up in anger, why, why they would suddenly believe things. They, they, they weren't known for faith you know, before the sermon, but after Jesus talked for a while, they just suddenly stepped into their miracle, into their breakthrough. Why? Because his words became spirit. Now, I want you to see, again, John kind of lifts that curtain so that we get to see how, how this kingdom of God works. So Paul, when he went to expand on this, uh, this concept, he said in Romans 14, verse 17, he said, the kingdom of God, <coughs> excuse me, the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's not of this world. It's righteousness, takes care of the sin issue. Peace, takes care of the torment issue. Joy, takes care of the healing issue. Remember, laughter is medicine. All right? So he's giving a revelation of the nature of this kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy. Two of those three things are felt realities. When people avoid experience, they avoid kingdom. Christianity, the gospel, is not a philosophy. It's a relationship. And while people can get weird and extreme and fall into deception and experience, you're automatically in it without the, the experience. That was a good point, Bill. That's a very, very good point. All right. All right. I'm sorry. I, I, I almost went off the deep end again. It's, it's so tempting to leap, you know. Leap, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> people, people think that their intellectual strength is going to keep them from deception. Well, they're already deceived. All right, never mind. That's all right. So here we've got... Here we've got... The kingdom of God is not meat or drink. It's righteousness, peace, and joy. What's the next phrase? In the Holy Spirit. The kingdom is in the Holy Spirit. Kingdom, the king's domain, the realm of his dominion is where? It is in the presence of the Spirit of God. So when Jesus said, my words to you are spirit, he actually released the reality of God's dominion over every crowd he spoke to. Right? So every person now has a, a, a shift in options. What's available to a crowd of people or to an individual is different every time he speaks. Right? This, um, this is supposed to uh, provoke us and stir us up with a passion to be able to hear the voice of the Lord, to hear the subtle impressions that he gives, and to say what God is saying. Why? Because you've been given the same assignment. The same assignment to say what the Father is saying. What does that mean? That means that whenever you speak, the environment changes. Why? Because words become spirit. How many of you have been in a 
difficult situation. Maybe there's a loss of a loved one. Maybe there's a conflict. Maybe, but you're in a room with some friends, and it's just, it's just really, really a hard moment. And somebody walks in, and they make one statement, and suddenly the air is just clear. Does that make sense to you? It just suddenly, you don't know what happened. It wasn't just the brilliance of the idea. It wasn't that. It was, it was they came in and they said something that just kind of cleared all the smoke out of the air. What, what was it? Well, probably their words became spirit. So look at John 16. If you still have your Bible open to it, you maybe got bored and gave up on me. Um, John 16, verse 12, Jesus says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. I still have many things to say to you. We're going to read several more verses, but look at this. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Verse 13, however, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. That's a whole bunch of truth. He will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of, take, uh, of mine and declare it to you. Okay, go back to verse 12. And let's just kind of walk through these four verses, all right? He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. All right, let's put this into the context of John 6, which is 10 chapters earlier. My words are spirit. So now he says, I can't tell you everything I want to tell you because you can't bear it. You you don't have the weight-carrying capacity for what I would say. Now, how does that make sense? Because whenever he speaks, the presence is released, and the presence carries the kingdom. You can't bear it. In other words, when I speak, I release reality. Right? Whenever I speak to you, I release the reality of heaven. I release the reality of my world over you. You can't bear it. You don't have the weight-carrying capacity for what I would release over you so I'm going to hold back what I say. So that tells us then he's not interested in merely giving us nice ideas to tickle our imagination. He's not just trying to make us smarter. He's not just trying to fulfill our need for correct doctrine. All those things are valuable and important, but that's not his concern. His concern is, is that I don't want to release over you something you can't live with. How many know if you're if you're a bodybuilder and you've strengthened your muscles to carry a certain weight is a is a pleasure. It's the, the I have the weight carrying capacity because I've been working at it for a long time and I now can carry this load and it's a privilege to carry this load. But that same load put upon the shoulders of somebody who is not prepared for it, what should have been a pleasure is now a burden. Does that make sense? It's it's kind of the picture if, if you can work with me on that. I, I don't want to create something over you that isn't a blessing. I, I, how many know that Israel often got blessed and it became a curse because of how they responded to the blessing? That which was supposed to prosper them caused them to be independent from God. And so the thing that was supposed to draw them to him in gratitude caused them to withdraw from him because of independence and arrogance. It wasn't the problem of the gift. It was the heart condition that the gift landed on. Right? Right? All right. So here the Lord is saying, I have so many things to tell you, which is fascinating to me because I, I've got to be careful. Um, I, he's, he's not going to give us any more books of the Bible. All right? So when I say hearing from God, uh, there's new books that, you know, will be added to Scripture. I, no, I, that's, that's stupid. I don't, I don't believe that for a moment. But how many of you have read a verse for 30 years and then one day he opens it up to you? And it's like I, I read it for the thousandth time and finally I understand it. You know, it's, it's, like, it's like there are so many layers to truth. 
He just takes us deeper and deeper. It's kind of like the, the, the rings of an onion. He just takes and peels back another layer time after time after time. And he does this for us in our relationship with him. And so now he's, he's got things that he wants to say that he's never uttered. Isn't that amazing to me? Isn't that amazing? It's amazing to me that he, he's got things on his mind that he just can't say yet. Now, I don't mean he's going to add to Scripture, but he's going to add to our understanding of what's already written. All right. So in verse 13, he says, However, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, and he has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak of his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. Do you remember where Jesus said, I only say what I hear my Father say. I only do what I hear, see my Father do. He, he just revealed how. How did he know what the Father was doing? The Holy Spirit would reveal it to him, right? He doesn't speak on his own authority. He only says what he hears the Father says. So here's the Holy Spirit who is on him in the form of a dove and remained. That's the connection that Jesus has with the Father is the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit has been given to him to do what? To reveal what he's saying. All all I want you to do is see that John lifts the curtain on how this thing works. All right, all right. He will guide you into all truth. Uh, He will uh, not speak on his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak. He will tell you things to come. That's fascinating. He will tell you things to come. The most hope-filled person in the universe is God. He is never depressed. (laughs) He never looks at the planet and goes, I mean, there's nothing that intimidates him. There's nothing he looks at and goes, well, that one caught me by surprise. (laughs) I didn't see that coming. It it just never happens. He's, He's got hope because he knows he's able to complete what he said he would complete. He knows of his own capacity to complete his promise to humanity. So when he is going to tell you things to come, how many of you were have been raised in some sort of a church environment, and this would be my testimony, it may not be yours, but a church environment when when you heard that God was going to show you things to come, that meant he was going to show you the calamities and the difficulties that were going to hit the planet. That's the environment I grew up in because there wasn't much good news. It was pretty much bad news and this is what you don't do and, 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 and you know, just pray for Jesus to come back because there's a big devil out there and we just need to get rescued, you know. You know, Jesus didn't do everything he did so you and I could do church. He didn't suffer the way he suffered so that you and I could barely make it. He didn't barely raise from the dead. (laughs) He didn't squeak through a little crack between the stone and the opening to the tomb. He rose triumphant, absolutely victorious, and that same spirit of God lives inside of you. He is not subtle in his triumph. telling you things to come. You know, when the Lord said there would be wars and rumors of wars and things of that nature, he wasn't giving us a promise. He was describing the conditions into which he was sending his last day's transformational army. He was saying, this is the environment I'm sending you into. Verse 14 says, he will glorify me, referring to the Holy Spirit. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Uh, 15 goes with it. All things the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said, he will take of mine and declare it to you. Now, you've got to catch this because this is kind of what I'm building to. This, uh, th- this whole thought really moves me because Jesus, Jesus is God. 
And as God, he owns everything. I mean, everything that exists in every realm, realms that we aren't conscious of. He owns everything in those realms too. Everything is his. It all is for him. It was made by him and for his pleasure, his absolute delight in all that he has made. When he was through with creation, he said to himself, you did a great job. This is good. And there's nothing he could have done to improve upon his creation. And so Jesus, as God, owns everything. But when he became man, he gave up everything. And then he re-inherited everything as a man. Why? Because it's the only way we could be brought into the inheritance. Because he re-inherited everything as our elder brother. And then what does he say here? He says, everything is mine. Everything the Father has is mine. And the Holy Spirit will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is what I want you to see. This, again, is that the whole concept that whenever Jesus speaks, he creates realities. Picture this stage as kind of being symbolic of a, of a bank vault. And in this bank vault is everything. Everything in the spirit world, the natural world, everything that exists in all of creation, everything that exists is in this bank vault. And the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, is going to take what is mine. So he goes into the bank vault. He takes what belongs to Jesus and he puts it in word form and declares it to you. He's taking what's mine and he transfers to your account through the declaration. Every time he speaks, there's a transfer of heavenly resource to enable you and me to accomplish what we were born to accomplish. So he takes, Jesus said, he takes what is mine and he declares it to you. He, remember, he speaks and creates realities. Words become spirit. Spirit contains kingdom. Jesus said, it's my Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Why don't, uh, we're not going to go where I had planned to go, but we'll go somewhere and have fun. Let's go. Go with me to, um, oh, goodness. Go with me to Matthew 13, and I'll, I'll end it on, on, uh, with this passage. Matthew 13. This is way too long of a story to start at this part in, the, in the, our, our time. So let me just kind of summarize. Do you remember the, the parable of the seed and the sower? You guys, most of you remember that. Um, this is where Jesus is illustrating um, the nature of the kingdom as it pertains to seed planted in ground. And so he shows us different kinds of soil, different kinds of planting conditions, okay, because he's revealing the soil is what determines the harvest, because the seed is the same in all the conditions of the soil. So when God speaks, in every person in this room, he doesn't speak a high-quality seed to this person, a low-quality seed to this one. He gives every person the exact same seed of promise and hope and potential impact, all of that stuff. It's given to everyone. So everyone's treated the same in that sense, all right? 
And so he's giving us an illustration of these kinds of uh, um, soils. So he says, therefore, here in verse 18, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes, snatches away what was already sown in his heart. This is he who received the seed by the wayside. He who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. He who receives the seed among thorns is he who uh, receives the word, and the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But he who receives the seed on good ground is he who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit, produces some hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. This is one of the uh, cornerstone parables in the Bible. By cornerstone, I mean uh, a cornerstone is uh, in, a, in a building where they, uh, in biblical days, they would build a building and there would be a keystone that would be put in the corner. And that cornerstone would actually set the parameter of the building, number one, but number two would actually hold everything together. So it was kind of like the most important stone. It was unique. It was different than all the others. It wasn't just another brick. It was a stone that set the parameters, the boundaries, the borderlines, all right? This parable is a cornerstone parable. In other words, if you understand this one, a whole bunch of other stuff will make sense. And so what we need to do is recognize where God puts emphasis. Because sometimes he wants to talk to you about this, but you have no place to put it until you get this, right? All right, so here's, here's the story. So he deals with four different kinds of soil. It's worthy of, of good study. We're not going to. I'm just going to take one word out of it <clears throat> and talk to you about this. In the first verse where he talks about uh, the seed that falls on the wayside, he says, when a person doesn't understand the word, the enemy comes, the birds come and take the seed. So the implication is understanding gives the seed depth in soil so the bird can't take it, right? You get the picture? When there's, when, there's, um, when there's no understanding, the seed lays on top of the ground so the bird is able to come. So you get the picture. The understanding would be the tenderness of soil that receives the word, all right? At the end of the parable, he says, those who understand it produce fruitfulness, some hundred, some sixty, some thirtyfold. All right. Here's the picture. The word understanding here is a word that basically means um, it's, it's learning that we do through our five senses. Um, let, let me illustrate it this way. Let, let's, say that I, uh, let's say that I was bringing a message today about caring for the poor and that all of us can do something. And so I, I, challenge, I challenge everybody in the room. Let's, let's upgrade our compassion for the poor. Let's look for people that are hurting. Let's do something. Let's, let's not be overwhelmed by the size of the problem and do nothing. Let's at least do something for somebody. And so I give you that challenge. Everybody in the room says, amen, that's a good word. All right. Some will walk out of the building with an intellectual understanding but not an understanding from the heart that produces change. What is that? That's the first verse in the explanation of the parable. That seed sown on the wayside. Why? Because the seed stayed on the top of the ground. Right? So what does the seed do? The seed actually invites the devourer because it's not put into the heart. Right? How is it put into the heart? Practical human experience. If I hear that same word, and I say, I turn to my wife and I say, we've got to do something. We've got to change something. Got, let's, let's, do, let's, let's take a percentage of our grocery money and let's take 5% of it and let's just, let's just set that aside every week and we'll just find a needy family to give it to. Or let's go buy groceries or something. But so, so we think of something. We just purpose together. We've got to do something from what we've heard. What just happened? That seed, because it got put into practical human experience, just got put into a place where the enemy has no access to it. 
Does that make sense? So now it doesn't mean it doesn't mean I have full understanding of the word that was spoken. It means that the seed, the, that which carries the DNA of God on his view of brokenness in humanity is now a part of my life, and it cannot be stolen. It can't be stolen because I have practical human experience to back what was just spoken. I may not be mature in it. I may not be all developed. I may not have, it maybe hasn't changed my life yet, but it is secure in me because I took it beyond the surface of the soil, put it into practical human experience. In other words, things that I learned through my five senses, I can touch the money I saved. I can touch the person I give to. I have interaction with them and expressing some sort of compassion, affection, or concern. And so something has now been worked into my personality through that seed of God's word that was more than just my amen in a service. Now, here's the most dangerous part to me is that when you hear a word that you agree with but do not put into action, a deception comes over us where when we hear that word again, let's say that I I bring the word on caring for the poor, all right? And in three months, you have another guest speaker or your own pastor stands up. Somebody stands in this pulpit and gives the challenge for caring for the poor. Everyone who heard my message on caring for the poor can say amen to the next one, even if no action was ever taken. And there's this idea that because I intellectually understand the concept, I am what the Word says. But I don't have biblical understanding. I have an acceptable cultural understanding of a concept. Did that that part make sense to you? So it's possible then for me to hear that same word that brought conviction the first time, but because I resisted that convicting word changing my lifestyle, now I've learned to live with the pressure of conviction and I can relieve the pressure of conviction by saying amen to the message that now comes a second time. Or I can talk about it in a Bible study group and we can share our conviction and never put put into practical human experience, never put it into that which the five senses can experience. And so we create this buffer zone between us and the reality of truth. And we acknowledge, yes, this is true. Yes, people need to be doing something about this. I'm so glad he had the courage to preach that message because we really need this. Yay for our pastor. He's really hitting after our hard stuff here. Our church needs to do something. And there's this illusion that because I understand here, I understand here. All right, we just went on a world tour of something. I'm not sure where we went. But I look at you and I 